all for joining us today to discuss how the fashion industry is looking at Createch. Um, I want to do some very quick introductions to our panel. We've got incredible and inspiring individuals um, who are going to be looking at the role of both uh, technology and, of course, positive fashion, which is front of mind for the fashion industry at the moment. So we have uh, Tom Fidian, who's Innovation Lead, Creative Industries, UK, RI, Innovate UK. Dilaj Hora, Senior Vice President, Raw Materials, Product Engineering and Quality at Burberry. And Jane Shepherdson, Chair of My Wardrobe HQ. So I'm very much hoping that this panel is going to be helping our new Institute of Positive Fashion to shape the role of technology to help us drive sustainable practices um, in all areas of our business, but particularly looking at manufacturing, supply chain, um, and the circular fashion economy. Uh, for those of you that don't know about the Institute of Positive Fashion very quickly, um, is that we've established it to help share global excellence, set a high bar in terms of standards, and help uh, move the UK to be leaders in a circular fashion economy. So uh, only launched this year, big ambition, uh, but great to be able to get all of your perspectives on the opportunity as a whole, um, and of course, how technology must play its part. Uh, so Tom, uh, if you don't mind, uh, we're gonna start with you, and um, would love you to kick off by telling uh, us how you see the value of the UK becoming a world leader in a circular economy. I just think there's just a, a fantastic and great opportunity for the UK. I, I mean, there's limits to how, how big manufacturing will become in the UK when it comes to fashion, but there's actually, there's no limits when it comes to the platforms, the digital services that we can actually create and inform and sell throughout the globe. I think we're in a fantastic position. Uh, at a recent visit, uh, you were with me, Caroline, to uh, Paris. All they were doing was referencing our research base here. So we're in a great opportunity to harness that research base, innovate, create commercial opportunities, not only help the environment and society, but also create a great, a great new ecosystem and uh, economic opportunity. It sounds really simple, doesn't it? Um, is it um, you're right, is that there was a lot of reference to our research base. Um, but tell me a little bit about the experience of how um, R&D and the fashion industry are perceived by you and your team and government generally and what more we can do? Well then that's a fantastic question. I think in my experience, and my experience is limited throughout the creative industries, it does seem that the fashion sector hasn't created the market opportunities for digital innovators to come in. Now normally digital innovators come when they're incentivized, when they see a great opportunity where they can come and sort of turn the sector on its head, disrupt it and create a, a whole new sort of like ecosystem. And I think with the fashion sector, especially with sustainable fashion, the challenges are so great, there are no easy answers. So at this moment in time, we aren't seeing as many innovators and much R&D happening in this sector as our other creative sectors. However, I think with some of the uh, work and initiatives that we've actually started to uh, push through, we are seeing more people uh, coming along and we're actually starting to see a little bit of momentum. Hopefully that will continue. And so we'll be actually you know, generating the same amount of innovators and R&D practices as other sectors. So that sounds like a fantastic opportunity. And certainly, as you said, is that we're at a very particular moment in time where the fashion industry is looking at maybe its environmental impact, what it can do differently. There's kind of this uh, opportunity that's been created by this dreadful pandemic to really look at kind of resetting the industry. Uh, so if there's willingness for industry and um, there's an opportunity, is that what role does government play in maybe helping push that forward and nudge it forward? Well, I think, uh, as I said before, the challenge is huge. And the fact is that there are lots of fantastic organisations doing some really good work, but this is a systemic problem. So it does require industry working together. It does require academia and the research base and also it requires government as policymakers to work together. I also think there's a fantastic role for government to convene all this because at the moment it's almost like there's a first move disadvantage. So if you're the first person to make yourself fully sustainable, you're probably not going to be as competitive. So all these things need to move at the same time. And also, as you're well aware, you know, this costs money. There are things, yeah. there's research that doesn't exist in the marketplace. There's whole industries that need to shift its way of thinking. So, Government has two roles here. One, to convene academia, industry, to ensure that it's all going, uh, working together, and that everything can act, is well connected. And also, 
to invest some money to prime the market to make sure that it, it can work mm -hmm. and it only needs you know relatively a small amount of money to get that going and hopefully that will create all the incentives for these new innovators to come in and it will be self-sustaining going forward that's fantastic and i think as the fashion industry historically has been quite self-sufficient in many ways and maybe that's why it's not been as connected uh, as it, we're hoping it's going to be in terms of research and r d facilities uh, in terms of moving it forward. Um, uh, I'm going to come to, let's press pause, I can have more questions uh, to come back to you on. But um, Gilard, as you're working in one of our biggest uh, designer brands, uh, known the world over, and actually known for its innovation as well, not just in terms of um, uh, design, uh, but also in terms of business models, material innovation, etc. Tell us a little bit around uh, sort of what you're seeing at the moment and, uh, of course, your view of the role that technology can play. I know it's something that you think about uh, quite a lot. Sure. Uh, thank you, Caroline. Uh, I think that innovation is a state of mind. And innovation has huge opportunities today, as much as it was relevant in the past. Uh, at Burberry, a lot of our guiding principles are around waste elimination, climate change, carbon footprint, digitalization, that allow a huge opportunity for creative problem solving. So uh, there's a lot of work, therefore, that goes on in terms of us addressing these elements in a focused manner in terms of how we create product. Industry at large, uh, again, needs to start getting a bit more focused in terms of where innovation and technology can play a role. Uh, to give you an example, it was very uh, common for the fashion industry professionals to be traveling across the globe uh, at the drop of the hat to take care of sourcing related issues, ethical concerns, auditing, inspections, approvals, etc. I think what these circumstances have brought to light is that with very simple technology, some of these elements can be achieved very well from a distance. And a big part of uh, our efforts in the past few months have been how do we take uh, the whole process of product creation, product approvals, prototyping, manufacturing into the digital space, uh, thereby increasing the efficiency, the agility of the process while not losing the level of accuracy and engagement. Mm -hmm. And um, and how have you found that to be? Then? Is that uh, obviously that's been an incredible challenge for so many businesses, as you said, it's been ingrained that people would sort of jump on an aeroplane and go and sort of uh, sort of get into some of those technical challenges. You know, how how has technology changed that, and has it changed it permanently, or will we return to that when uh, you know we all start to be able to fly and travel more freely? Uh, I think the there were a huge amount of skeptics in the beginning, so uh, including within my own organization where certain things were deemed not to be feasible to be done without uh, being physically present. Uh, what the circumstances forced us to do was to pilot. And I think that was the best thing that could happen in terms of proving the point that something could be done. And as people tried out new approaches, new things, uh, they've realized that uh, they can en take entire chunks of processes and uh, digitalize them. And where it's not possible to do so, you still have a level of physical engagement with product rather than with entities or with people. So I, I do think that uh, a big part of this change is permanent change as we've realized that it's possible. Mm -hmm. We are yet to see though the maturing of this change and its impacts. 
So, you know, we're relying on relationships that have been built over years and understanding a level of calibration that's been built over years, which has helped us transition into this space. But as new players come in, both within the organization and external partners, that's where the true challenges will come in of not being able to engage and interact face to face. So, uh, uh, you know, we're already looking at technology that then takes us into that realm where uh, you can improve the contextual understanding of uh, what we want our supply chain partners to to understand and, and respond to. Fantastic. Um, and I think there's so many roles that technology can play, can't there? Um, you know, is that one that we have talked about is the idea of auditing. And uh, I think is that particularly through the pandemic, there's a bit of a lot of conversations around the impact in terms of factories all over the world, uh, including some here in the UK. And that idea of, um, of digitizing uh, the audit process and actually making it worker generated is quite an interesting opportunity. Absolutely. I, I think uh, there's a huge opportunity with the whole auditing process and the approach uh, wh where I think uh, there are some existing players as well as startups uh, beginning to look at digital platforms uh, which allow end-to-end -end risk based approach uh, which are AI assisted so they basically map out the entire process, map out the existing known risks within regions, uh, within materials, uh, et cetera, and then highlight where issues could potentially come up. So that's, I think, a very interesting realm, and it's already yeah. uh, beginning to be rolled out. Where I think there is, again, some interest being generated is vis uh, 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 image recognition software to be installed and, and more cameras to be used so that certain activities can be mm. performed remotely. Now, obviously, a lot of uh, uh, auditing is in lieu of trust. Whereas yeah. I think uh, uh, the way we need to look at technology is how can it reinforce the trust, transfer the accountability, or give a higher level of ownership on those being audited and then technology reinforces the principles that are agreed upon when you agree on terms of engagement. So I, I think there's opportunity there. We're already using uh, a digital platform to train. So when uh, new suppliers come in and, and they need to train their team members on policies and procedures, I think that bit is already something that I'm sure other organizations are also leveraging where they're able mm -hmm. to place trainings that can then be delivered 24 seven to their uh, team members as well. So there are these, these different elements, different parts of uh, uh, the auditing process that can go digital to a point where uh, today you can actually review an entire edit uh, audit electronically, you don't need to be physically present uh, and, and deliver a disposition. Fantastic to think about the opportunity that this could bring to an industry like ours, isn't it? Um, one final thing before I come to you, Jane, is um, material innovation. I know that we're talking about the, the role of technology um, in the fashion industry, but if we're talking about innovation, it would be very odd not to touch on material innovation, particularly when you're talking to uh, someone who's worked as a, you know, a fantastic business at Burberry that is known for that. So, um, is that tell us sort of your thoughts in terms of material innovation and uh, the opportunity really to to push that, particularly coming back to Tim uh, to Tom, sorry, um, view around uh, R and D. Sure. Uh, while I may not be able to speak about specific materials, I think uh, where I'm beginning to see a huge amount of traction, first of all, is in uh, plastics and polymers. So as sensitivity to plastic use uh, increases and, and awareness of uh, the contamination from plastic in our oceans, in our environment increases, uh, coupled with some pretty bold commitments by the industry to, to replace these materials. 
I think there's a lot more beginning to happen in this space where either regenerated cellulosic materials or renewable biomass is being used to substitute for plastics. Uh, obviously then this is being extended in other realms to use plant-based waxes, sericin from silkworms, which is an excellent medium to maintain uh, freshness uh, of materials, etc. So there's, there's some interesting uh, work happening in the space of bio-based or biomimicry to understand from nature what can be done to, to preserve. Another element is this uh, movement towards botanic materials, so substitution or alternatives that are coming into place for conventional animal hides and animal fur. Uh, this is still in its early stages, so by no means is it uh, luxury product ready, but I think already uh, with the amount of investment that's going into this space, you are beginning to see alternatives that can already make it to certain segments of the industry or certain end users. And I think mm -hmm. progressively this will keep increasing as a more responsible consumer uh, uh, comes into uh, the, the, the stream. Uh, finally, I, I also think that uh, something that will play a bigger role uh, is uh, with, as a consequence of the impact of the pandemic, uh, protective materials. So yeah. materials the, that are able to provide some sort of enhanced protection to an individual will become more and more important even in fashion-based apparel. So uh, these finishes or applications uh, which were very chemical in nature using triclosan and, and silver ions etc have existed but there's some very interesting new innovation uh, that uh, I've seen already and have worked on that you can look forward to in terms of uh, coming into place to make the consumer feel a bit more secure. Fantastic. It's a, uh, I could talk about material innovation for, for hours, but um, Jane, I want to come to you next before we get into sort of a, a more group discussion because uh, you're very much part of this new ecosystem of sort of a circular fashion economy and the role I guess in terms of my wardrobe being uh, very much a leader in the rental market is that it's a relatively new segment but growing fast. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the rental market, how it's grown over the last 10 years and the role of technology in that? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating one, really, because I guess rental has, has been around for years. You know, everyone remembers Moss Bros, sort of renting out a suit for a wedding. Um, but it's changed so dramatically, uh, particularly over the last 10 years, I think. Um, and, and, and probably the biggest player has been uh, Rent the Runway in the US, which uh, I think launched in 2009. So that's, what, 11 years ago now. Um, and I think that really drove um, the, the market in the US very, very quickly because it very, it gave people a viable alternative to, to buying, a, a, you know, a really obvious, easy way of doing it. Um, it's been much slower in the UK, partly because we haven't had this sort of viable alternative until very recently. Um, and I would say it's probably only been the last sort of three or four years where we've had a lot of a lot of businesses have emerged in the UK market um, to, to try and sort of you know, provide that that uh, that differential. And I think most of them are, are similar to my wardrobe HQ in that they're kind of um, both peer to peer platforms, and also they uh, you know brands can sort of trade trade through them if you like. Um, and, and I think it's it's fascinating. What what's the saddest thing about it really is that uh, pre-lockdown, uh, in sort of the early part of 2020, um, there was a huge amount of, of sort of press and goodwill 
surrounding the, the whole sort of rental um, market idea, if you like. Um, and in fact, if, if I look back to last October, you know, when we were sort of approaching brands, it was, it was quite difficult to sort of persuade them to, 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 to work with us or to collaborate. Um, in, in January, we were, it was sort of turning around. We were getting brands approaching us. All of a sudden, it felt like it was, uh, it was going to happen. People really wanted it to happen. Um, Sadly, of course, lockdowns happened and, and, and it's been an enormous hit to the rental business because, of course, there are no events to go to. Yeah. Um, so, so whilst we're, we're still hearing that, that, that people are, are very sort of accepting of the idea of it and, and that seems to be growing, um, you know, unfortunately, we've, we've all been hit really badly by the fact that there's, there's actually no need for it at the moment. Um, I'm, I'm still optimistic, though. I think, obviously... Okay events will come back again um, and, and, I, and I really am I'm such a supporter of, of, of rental fashion even from a personal point of view you know it's it, it sort of I, I had a real epiphany I guess um, you know a, a few months ago just just the, the fact that, that you can rent these incredible pieces that that you know you would never be able to afford or perhaps wouldn't want to afford to buy um, you can rent them for, for one night and then they can be shared by another 20, 30 people. I mean, it's, it's, it's such an incredible way of making it accessible for people. Um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's, yeah, I, I think it's still, I think it will still grow and I think there is still absolute room for it. And I noticed yeah. that, that Selfridge has recently have dipped their toe in the water and they brought um, her, one of our competitors into, into the rental process. So. I know um, that's a very interesting move, isn't it? For one of our, <laughs> you know, very much established the, you know bricks and mortar retailers absolutely and i think that i think they all realize that they kind of have to be a part of this conversation you know or, or at least they have to try it they have to see you know how, what it means to them how, how they can work around it how they you know that they're, they're sitting on, on on a lot of dead stock um quite often so it, it's uh, you know it, it can be mutually beneficial i think yeah. As you said, it's a brilliant way to democratise particularly high-end fashion, isn't it? And make it available to everyone throughout the UK. It's a brilliant opportunity. But what's the role that technology plays in the business? Um, well, um, obviously, we're, we're just an online business, so um, we, we're relying on um, we're relying on that for, to get our, our customers. Um, I have to say that at the moment, in terms of, uh, of our own log logistics, um, we, we have an incredible kind of distribution centre outside of London, obviously, uh, where, where everything is, is processed, is tagged, is sort of, is, is, is kept, um, is, is kept count of. Um, we have an ozone cleaning process because we're keen not to try um, to, to, to overload the dry cleaning processes because we know that that's um, an issue. Um, and we try to we try to limit our um, our carbon footprint in terms of our delivery, but w which is something that that is impossible for for us to do completely. But we realise that um, you know we we certainly need to try, and we encourage our customers, in fact, if they can do, to drop off and pick up themselves. Um, obviously, that's not possible for everybody. But um, uh, after that, we try to use bicycles, we use electric vehicles, etc. So it's it's uh, I, I think so even if you if you bring that in you, that the uh, the rental business model is still one that's that's environmentally a lot more responsible than than encouraging people to go out and buy something for for one event perhaps. And do you think the way consumer behaviours are changing and adapting more to um, to rental models are they also thinking about their footprint in terms of logistics as well? Do you think, or is that sort of a step too far? Sorry, sorry, say that again. Yeah, I was saying is that consumers obviously are starting to think more responsibly in terms of the rental market. Yes. Um, but you said is that we're dropping off in logistics. So are they considering the logistics footprint or is that one step too far for well, I'd like to think they, I'd like to think they were considering it, but looking at the success of Amazon makes me it makes me wonder about <laughs> that actually. Um, so I, I think perhaps that's that's of lesser importance to people at the moment. I think I think they're perhaps more yeah. concerned with the how, how a product is made, uh, the, the supply chain, etc., than uh, than the delivery at the moment. But I do think that's something that that they will start to consider. I think it's only a matter of time. But, but, you know, 
So it's, it's very hard with, with everybody, everybody moving on to, on to online shopping. I mean, and unless you're prepared to sort of go and pick it up yourself, um, you know, that there has to be, a, there needs to be a way around this. Absolutely. And I think is that, um, so that brings me nicely on to sort of the collective questions, I guess, for the three of you is that, is this idea of the ecosystem that creates a fashion industry that's much more circular um, and the role that everybody plays. Um, you touched a little bit in terms of brands being sat on stock. And I think particularly at this moment in time is that that's front of mind for everybody having had stores that were closed, orders that were canceled. Um, and obviously is that we're in a situation where there's quite a significant amount of waste um, that will come through this period. And there always has been in the fashion industry is would love your thoughts as it's a project particularly that we're looking at, but um, sort of, how you see the UK potentially improving its infrastructure to help us manage some of that waste, um, and indeed potentially the role that technology or even sort of uh, potentially new businesses, a bit like rental, might play in helping reduce it. So a much bigger sort of fashion industry question. I'm actually going to come to Tom on this first um, in terms of potentially the role that government might play in helping us address that as a challenge. I think, um, I mean, uh, Innovate UK is a government agency, so I don't get to set policy, but I think, um, <laughs> I think there is a role for government to understand what incentives and what policies to put in place to ensure that industry goes in the right direction. And I think it's going to be very careful to make sure that it doesn't, you know, over-regulate to actually lock people out and actually let um, innovators play. But I think there is a great opportunity to invest in the infrastructure um, yeah. I mean, you, you, you work in the industry, I don't work in the industry, so you, you're more aware of the issues when it comes to dead stock and also consumer waste. I'm not comfortable with the idea of any waste or dead stock being disposed of or being um, uh, exported to other countries to deal with. And I think it's far better and far more valuable for us to invest in our infrastructure, invest in our recycling centres. Not only that, it will actually help us become sort of world leaders in, the, in those areas. It will actually help incentivize ways of gaining value out of this dead stock. Uh, and it will also improve our knowledge uh, for the whole of the sector. So it will actually help support designers to understand what we need to do. What, what are the criteria to ensure that maybe a garment will last longer or it's easier to recycle and reuse? Uh, as well as that, it will help our manufacturing process. So I think investing in the issue to make sure that the UK is on the front foot is going to be far more valuable than just ignoring it and doing the status quo. I think there's a lot of other interesting projects that are happening in Europe. And I just think that if we don't do anything, we will just be adopting their practices, which may not work as well for our um, economy. And so we'll just be following someone else's um, um, uh, processes. So I think it's a much better place for us to actually be, you know, leaders and actually drive it forward so to have a product that actually uh, reflects our economy. Fantastic. Um, I mean, we have such incredible uh, both designers, uh, so innovators in creativity, but also business thinking in the UK. Is that Gillard, from a, a brand perspective, but also from an industry perspective, is that uh, what do you think about the opportunity and? Um, and would love sort of maybe your thoughts in terms of some of the other new businesses that might come out of that. I think you might have touched on them before. Yeah, certainly. So I, I think that, that uh, this presents a tremendous opportunity for the UK. Uh, to add to the points that Tom was making, I, I believe firmly that, that the one thing that needs to happen uh, without further delay is uh, training and education in circular design. Uh, because unless the consciousness about circularity exists at the point of creation, it becomes more and more complex as you move down the supply chain to make it happen. And that's where I think the UK could, uh, could use some uh, momentum and, and, and have a competitive edge because I don't know of many countries that have adopted a policy around circular design principles. Having said that, I also think that it's, uh, 
today it's incredibly complex if you wanted to reprocess waste either manufacturing waste or dead stock uh, it becomes incredibly complex because you have to move it to other locations uh, there again i see a unique opportunity where I, i'm not sure if we're competing with other countries but i think that there are different parts of the world that have developed competitiveness in different elements around recycling and revaluation of uh, material and product waste. And it is bringing those together, stitching it together and producing a viable business model in the UK here that could again uh, do some phenomenal things for the industry here in the UK, including spurring new activity. Uh, will that lead to us importing the waste from other parts of Europe, perhaps, to revalue it? I don't know, but it would all go towards the betterment of the industry uh, in general. It, it, it seems to me that, that uh, also we need to address the, the overproduction within the industry. Mm. Uh, and this is certainly somewhere where, where technology can, can help us and, it's, and is starting to help. You know, we're, we're seeing some, some much more advanced forecasting models and, and our algorithms, etc., cetera, to, to try to predict better than we currently do how much of something we're actually going to need, you know, because so uh, there's such a staggering amount of, of product that actually isn't being sold at all. You know, we, we shouldn't really be in this position. We should be trying to address that first in, in a way before we start to address what we actually do with the, with the waste afterwards. Um, and I know there is a lot of work going on, but, but it seems to me perhaps it's not happening fast enough. I, I do agree. I, I think uh, both, if we start looking at some of the other industries, they do a phenomenal job, both with demand planning as well as supply planning. I think these concepts, these, this science is still uh, in need of much more development as it applies to the fashion industry. I also think that, uh, you know, sometimes fashion is viewed as uh, unpredictable, you are appealing to the desires, you don't know how the customer will react to, to certain uh, things and, and, and so on. But I do think that as we start bringing in technology, as uh, our ability to handle big data improves, all those elements become much more predictable and analyzable should there be desire to to start looking in that direction there is a science behind this that that works yeah i i, I completely i completely agree with that but i think that has to be the desire behind it as well because i think a lot of the models that uh currently brands are looking at um you know that they're, they're kind of you know that the whole markdown of stock is 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 built into the very beginning of the process so mm -hmm. we're all aware that we're overproducing you know a, a certain amount of stock but but there's no real desire not to because at the end of the day it will be it will give us extra cash in the till and Joan, do you think that this is a moment in time when actually this is an opportunity to break that cycle, when there's so much change going on in the world, not just in the industry? I, I really do. I really do. And I was so encouraged to hear about this um, group of, of designers and brands. I'm, I'm not quite sure what they call themselves. I'm sure um, that the audience will know them. But, but re-looking really again at how many seasons we have, um, mm -hmm. you know, ex exactly how much new stock we, we need to bring in. And what I think is fascinating actually this year is that so many brands that I've spoken to are looking at a lot of the dead stock that they have from this year. And they're saying, well, actually, you know what? I can sell that next year. You know, it's not, yeah. it's not actually dead. I, I, you know, it doesn't have to be new. For next year, I can I can style it in different ways. I can you know I I can make it look mm. more interesting in a way. And so I think everyone is starting to look at because as well it hits everybody's bottom line. You know, so I think everyone's yeah. starting to look at ways that that they can actually make it work for them in a more responsible way. I think also with um, the young designers that we have coming through our colleges, is they're so focused now is that uh, in terms of their impact on the environment, the use of 
uh, upcycled, recycled materials. Um, and obviously, is that having platforms that they don't necessarily have to produce a huge amount, but actually can look at rental models for that product is very exciting for them because they're very conscious of the amount of product that they're producing and looking at other ways to monetize their creativity. So um, I think it's a, an exciting opportunity for those. But also is that one of the things that's come out of that is the facilities to even be able to get access to those materials, you know, to uh, the facilities and the skills to be able to unpick and recycle and upcycle. And indeed the, um, the knowledge and information that makes it the opportunity for chemical recycling for so many different materials a viability. So uh, we know there's a big challenge, but an enormous opportunity for an industry that looks like it's set to really address uh, change and to to move forward and I think that's something that we find it very exciting uh, at the British Mapping Council at the prospects of what our industry might look like in the next five ten years okay is that uh, we're nearing the end of our session so um, any sort of final thoughts or comments uh, before I wrap up from anybody No, <laughs> I can't believe this. Is that I'll be picking all of your brains afterwards. I guess sort of in final summary, Tom, is that uh, we will definitely be in touch in terms of the opportunity for industry and government to work together in this. Is that Innovate UK do a fantastic job in terms of pushing R and D and uh, innovation within the UK, and fashion should absolutely be a part of that. Um, Gillard and Jane, thank you very much for your industry insight and expertise. I think it uh, brings the challenges to life that all of us are facing, uh, but also the opportunity. I think is that in these challenging times, having an opportunity, looking at opportunities uh, as we move forward, and certainly environmental impact and the opportunity and use of technology is up there front and centre. So thank you all very much for your time. Thank you for joining us. Goodbye. <laughs>